Live from Bryant Denny Stadium with special guests, feature stories, and a comprehensive look at Alabama's upcoming game. This is Crimson Tide Kickoff on WVUA 23. And good morning, everybody, and welcome in to our WVUA 23 studios inside Bryant Denny Stadium. I'm Gary Harris, and you're watching Crimson Tide Kickoff. We're going to get you set for Alabama's final home game of the season. My, how time does fly. Alabama will take on Arkansas this afternoon, a little after 2.30 on CBS in the CBS SEC Game of the Week. Now, a win by the Crimson Tide will clinch the SEC West Division and give Alabama a spot in the SEC Championship game against Georgia in two weeks over in Atlanta. But it will not be an easy game as Arkansas is a good football team coming in here at 7-3. and three. And remember, one of their losses was in overtime by one point to Ole Miss. So they're a quality team. Let's get you started, as we always do, with our Bama headlines. For the latest on the Crimson Tide, you don't need the newspaper. You need Bama headlines. And the second-ranked Crimson Tide opened as a 20-and-a-half-point favorite over number 21 Arkansas today. My gosh, Alabama still gets a lot of respect by the odds makers. Today is just the fifth time in series history that both teams are ranked in the top 25. It's also the second time this season that Arkansas has traveled to play the second-ranked team in the nation. Last month, Arkansas lost to then number two Georgia, 37 to nothing. Of course, the dogs are number one now. Well, when Arkansas visits Tuscaloosa today, it will mark the Crimson Tide's first non-Auburn SEC opponent on senior day since 2005. That year, the Tide played and lost in overtime to LSU. A spot in the SEC championship game, as I said, will be on the line for the Crimson Tide as well. If Bama wins, they'll travel to Atlanta to play Georgia on December the 4th. All that plus basketball stays red hot. We'll recap midweek wins by both Alabama men and women, and we'll talk to a few of the restaurants in Tuscaloosa that are considered hot spots to watch the game if you can't make it to the game in person. Also, we'll hear interviews with radio personality Ryan Fowler, the host of the game on Tide 100.9 FM, and we'll take you behind enemy lines with Ty Richardson of ESPN Radio Arkansas and the website Hit That Line. He'll give us the inside scoop on the Hogs. Well, on his radio show this past Thursday night, Alabama head coach Nick Saban confirmed that Royal Williams will miss the rest of the season with an injury suffered in the win over New Mexico State. Now, three scholarship running backs have been lost to injury. Williams, Jace McClellan, and freshman Kamar Wheaton. Next man up mentality, though. You know Coach Saban. He said on Monday, this is a great opportunity for Trey Sanders, plus the guy who has been Alabama's workhorse, former Hillcrest Patriots standout Brian Robinson, says he feels he can carry even more of the load if necessary. Whatever is necessary, like, I feel like, you know, I prepare myself. You know, I'm ready for, you know, whatever it is, you know, I need to do, you know, to help this team, I mean, you know, be effective to this offense. So, you know, if it's 20 carries, 30 carries, you know, I'm ready for whatever. And Nick Saban said that receiver Slade Bolden has been working at running back this week. Last week after Roydell Williams' injury, Des Moines Kennedy and Christian Leary a linebacker and receiver by trade, got playing time at running back as well. On his radio show this past Thursday night, Coach Saban referenced Brian Robinson, who made the decision to transfer, or Keelan Robinson, I should say, excuse me, Keelan Robinson, who made the decision to transfer in the offseason to Texas. If Robinson were still at Alabama, Coach Saban believes he would be playing a lot of football. Sometimes be careful what you wish for and what decisions that you make. Yeah, well, we had five, and then we had Keelan Robinson, who you know, left in the portal, you know, he'd be playing a lot. Yeah. So, you know, that's where I think sometimes these guys are a little short-sighted um, when they sort of m misread what their opportunity really would be uh, mm -hmm. if they tried to stay and compete. Yeah, Keelan Robinson, I mean, nothing you can do about it now, but <laughs> would you rather be at Texas as a backup and a team that's lost five games in a row? are here in Tuscaloosa on the second-ranked team in the country playing a lot of football. Like Coach Saban said, 
Short-sidedness can get you in trouble. Well, Arkansas hasn't beaten Alabama since 2006 when Mike Shula was the coach. But they got a man in charge now, Sam Pittman, who has a lot of confidence, and he certainly believes his team has an opportunity this afternoon. Why not? The Razorbacks are 7-3. and three. They're bowl eligible for the first time since 2016. Arkansas's record could even be better if the ball had bounced their way against Ole Miss. Arkansas lost 51-50 in overtime when it decided to go for a two-point conversion. Now, Al, yeah, get it, and, and they would have won that game. But K.J. Jefferson's pass was incomplete. Now, Arkansas hasn't beat Alabama at all since Nick Saban has been the head coach in T-Town. I don't know where he would match up statistic-wise. You know, there's a lot of stats out there. and and uh, But for us, he's – and I would say if you ask our opponents, he's – the real deal and worthy of being on that list. He certainly is for us. I respect every receiver that we play. Um, I do think that they have a talented group of receivers, um, and it's just up to us to do all the things necessary to prepare well and go out and execute it on Saturday. Of course, they're talking about Traylon Burks, the wide receiver for Arkansas. He's good. I mean, he's really good. He's big, he's fast, he's physical, and as good as he's been on offense, linebacker Bumper Poole, one of the great names in college football has had the same impact for the Razorbacks' defense. Number 20, Poole has recorded 100 tackles, including seven and a half for loss. Last week against LSU, he had 13 tackles and two stops behind the line of scrimmage. Big-time players. Well, Alabama has won 14 in a row. I've said it a couple times. Coach Nick Saban has not lost to the Razorbacks as head coach of the Crimson Tide. That's on the line this afternoon. And with a win, Alabama will move to 10-1. and one. That would be the 14th consecutive season with at least 10 wins and tie a major college record of consecutive seasons with double-digit victories matching Bobby Bowden in Florida State from 1987 to 2000. In fact, the only time Nick Saban didn't win 10 games, his first season at UA in 2007. All right, the weather forecast uh, is looking good. It's looking great in real life out there. It is absolutely gorgeous. This is football weather. But Gracie Dincost is with us in the Weather Center to let us know if it's going to stay beautiful. It could get a little cool, I'm thinking, Gracie. You may want to take a jacket because before the end of the game, it might cool off, huh? Yes, Gary, it is going to cool off later tonight, but it's been we had a cool start to our morning. We have warmed up quite a bit, though, from our low of 31. We're seeing a temperature of 57. Would you look at that? I mean, it is sunny outside. It's a beautiful day, and that sun's really going to warm us up if we look across central and west Alabama. We're seeing mid to upper 50s for many of us. Some of us are even still seeing those lower 50s, but clear across the radar, dry conditions, and that'll stay the conditions for the rest of the day. All of your full details for the game day forecast coming up in just a few minutes. Back to you, Gary. Thank you, Gracie. We look forward to that as we will check in again on this beautiful football weather Saturday. All right, Alabama will face uh – or face BYU in Charlottesville, Virginia, in the second round of the women's NCAA soccer tournament. Now, Alabama uh, had won a game against Clemson. They made history, and they were trying to get a second win. That shot by Cat Rogers just over the net. Under 30 seconds left in the half, BYU in the Alabama zone. Nice pass set up Addison Gardner. She beats Crone, the goalie for Alabama, for the third goal of the first half, and BYU would go on to win 4-1. to one. But still, Alabama makes history. The Tide beat Clemson for its first ever NCAA tournament victory. Came up short in the second round, but boy, got to be happy for Wes Hart and his program. They're making a move in the right direction. Well, coming up next on Crimson Tide kickoff, while Alabama is in the driver's seat to win the SEC West, the Arkansas Razorbacks are holding tight to their dream of a division title as well. Some things have to happen, but it could. We'll have a closer look. And we will take you behind enemy lines. Ty Richardson of ESPN Arkansas gives us the scoop on an Arkansas program that is prepared to play the number two ranked team in the country for the second time this season. And the student section of Alabama basketball has dubbed a new Crimson Chaos president. Come back after the break to see who now holds the throne. CTKO, we'll be, we'll be back right after this. You're watching Crimson Tide Kickoff on WVUA 23. Uh, this got to happen, this got to happen, this got to happen. But it's very hard to do, and uh, you have to give the, the credit to the kids. But to still be alive in week 11 in a mathematical situation, is, it's hard to do, and I'm happy that we have that opportunity. Welcome back to Crimson Tide Kickoff. I'm Gary Harris. Yes, Arkansas is technically alive for the SEC West Division title in a spot in Atlanta. But as you heard Sam Pittman say, the Razorbacks' odds are long and pretty tough to calculate for, you know, simple math reasons. But another calculation that will seem odd may be the senior day numbers 
for the Crimson Tide. Now, today is the final home game for Alabama seniors, but which players does that include? It's getting harder to figure out. Starting quarterback Josh Job and reserve linebacker Jalen Moody are the only two scholarship players listed as seniors on the roster. There are also eight redshirt seniors, although two sixth-year offensive linemen, Chris Owens and fifth-year running back Brian Robinson were honored during Senior Day Ceremony last season. The other redshirt seniors include starting defensive lineman Phil Mathis, injured starting outside linebacker Christopher Allen, a pair of rotational defensive players in LeBron Ray and Daniel Wright, and reserve tight ends Kendall Randolph and Major Tennyson. So we'll just have to see who's out there on the field today before the Arkansas game. Well, Arkansas has had a bit of a roller coaster season. They've been ranked as high as eighth in the nation before they lost three consecutive games. And now they've come roaring back into today's game, ranked 21st, they're on a roll again. To get a point of view on today's game from the Arkansas perspective, CTKO's Matthew Travis went behind enemy lines with Ty Richardson, the program director for Hit That Line on ESPN Radio Arkansas. Hey, Matt. Hey Gary, this week I spoke to Ty Richardson, who is a program director for ESPN's Arkansas radio station, and he emphasized the importance of Arkansas getting their run game established early in order to give them a chance in today's game. It's been a while. I mean, that, you think that's 18 years since the Hogs have gone. They haven't beaten Alabama since 2006 with Mitch Mustaine and Ben Cleveland. But for, if Arkansas has any chance in this game, you've got to get the ground game going. If Arkansas can't get the run game established early or just during the game, I don't see this being much of a football game, man. Richardson added that the Razorbacks need to get to Bryce Young and force him into difficult situations. And if they're not able to do that, it could be a long afternoon for Arkansas. If you can force Bryce into passing situations, you at least have to ch a chance to, to stagger their offense a little bit. He should not necessarily prone to make mistakes, but he's shown he will make mistakes if they put in interesting situations. Can Arkansas do that? I think it's going to be a story early. If Alabama has early success, I don't know if the Razorbacks are going to be able to slow down that Crimson Tide offense, which is still one of the best in all of college football. While the goal for Arkansas is obviously to win today's game, Richardson told me that it's early in the Sam Pittman era, and if the Razorbacks can at least keep today's game close, it could be a big step in the right direction. It's weird to say that you can take away a moral victory going in there and losing, but if you can keep it within 14 points, I think a lot of Razorback fans will be very happy. Not to say that they don't desperately want to win against the Crimson Tide, but they're understanding that Pittman's still in year two of what looks to be a longer rebuild process in Fayetteville. Another thing Richardson told me is that after a down week against LSU last week, Arkansas needs to get wide receiver Traylon Burks involved early and often because of the fact that he has a big impact on their offense and could get, have a huge impact on today's game. Reporting for CTK live outside Reese Pfeiffer Hall, I'm Matthew Travis. Thank you, Matthew. Yeah, Traylon Burks, as we've talked about, he, he's a game changer potentially for Arkansas in this game. So the Razorbacks will bring a confident and improved football team to Bryant-Denny Stadium this afternoon. But while confident and improved, make no mistake, Razorbacks head coach Sam Pittman still realizes what his team is up against. And the Arkansas offense, especially that offensive line, will have to deal with Crimson Tide edge rusher Will Anderson. He's been a nightmare for teams to game plan for this season. We know they have a, uh, an outstanding team, a lot, a lot of talent everywhere on all levels on defense. Uh, certainly, defensively, Will Anderson is as good a player as anybody has on their team, and he's going to be a um, major concern for ours. You know, number one thing you try to do is not let a difference maker make a difference, and with in his case, it's. It's very, very difficult. It's been fun to watch different how different teams have tried to approach that that problem. None of them having too much success. I really like listening to Coach Pittman. He just shoots straight with you. You know, you can have a game plan. You can prepare for Will Anderson. You can mimic what he does in practice, but you don't really – have a feel for it till you're on the field with him. And he's just one of those kind of players. I mean, he is a difference maker coming off the edge. That could be huge today. If Arkansas can block him, who knows? 
Richardson has more time to make plays, and maybe they can get it downfield to Traylon Burks, but easier said than done. All right, still to come on Crimson Tide kickoff, we'll take a look back at the top moments in the Alabama-Arkansas series that include two memorable postseason showdowns. And where is the best place to watch the game if you can't be there in person? CTKO's Tatum Vaught takes us around a few of Tuscaloosa's popular game day hotspots and goes in-depth on what they do to make the fans feel right at home. Well, a couple of the most memorable meetings between these two teams occurred before Arkansas was ever in the SEC. Frank Burrell is the head coach of the Razorbacks. Bear Bryant, head coach of the Crimson Tide, the 1962 Sugar Bowl, to decide the 1961 national champion. And Alabama would cap off a perfect 11-0 season with a 10-3 win over the Razorbacks. It was one of – it was – the first of six national championships for head coach Paul Bryant. The second time that Alabama and Arkansas played was in also in the Sugar Bowl, 1980. There is Coach Bryant taking on Lou Holtz and the Razorbacks, Alabama, going for its second straight national championship, and the Tide would get it as they beat the Razorbacks 24 to 9. So they won the national championship in 1978, and then 1979 went 12 and 0, capping it off with the championship win in the Sugar Bowl over Arkansas. Well, welcome back to CTKO. I'm Gary Harris. Well, ever since tailgating has returned, many fans have been taking advantage, of course. But Tuscaloosa also has a wide selection of restaurant and bar options for those who aren't into tailgating and may not be able to make it to the game. Tatum Vaught joins us live now outside the University of Alabama's Reese Pfeiffer Hall on the UA campus to tell us more about what these local spots have to offer. Tatum. Well, Gary, Bryant Denny isn't the only place that's packed on an Alabama game day. Every Saturday during football season, restaurants and bars in Tuscaloosa are full of fans gathering to watch the Crimson Tide. I caught up with local owners to get the inside scoop. You know, being so close to Brian Denny Stadium and being so iconic and having all the memorabilia and, and the history and tradition, uh, it's, it's a game day stop. So we have several thousand people that will make their way through the doors on a any given home game. Uh, yeah, it's pretty lively. Um, we kind of we kind of get crowds from college kids to adults. Um, so we do a really good mix of it. And so we've been very fortunate with that. Um, and people really love coming to Tuscaloosa for an Alabama game. There are endless restaurant and bar options for fans looking for a good time on an Alabama game day. Guests are guaranteed to be entertained by the atmosphere that local staples have to offer. They want to hit Ray Majamas, uh, have a burger. They want to hit Galette's and get a yellow hammer. They want to go to Buffalo Phil's and get a filibuster. And they want to go down to Innisfree and, and experience that when they're here. I think it's part of the tradition. I think it's, you know, what we do, we do well. Despite the long lines and overwhelming crowds, these title town destinations are a must see on game days. You know, we've built our brand, which has been good over the last 23 years. But this is, you know, it is part of Alabama. It's part of Tuscaloosa and it's an integral part of the college and student experience and fan experience. And, you know, our day every day we just try to, you know, represent the city, the state and the institution and the history of football. Uh, the best we can. These owners told me that although chaotic, home SEC games like this draw in the most fans. For those who don't have a ticket to the game, restaurants and bars are a great option to grab some food, get a drink, and watch the tide roll. Live from Reese Pfeiffer Hall for CTKO, I'm Tatum Vaught. Back to you, Gary. Thank you, Tatum. And you know, that's what a lot of people do, especially since finally they can come back to the games, is they come and they just want to be in Tuscaloosa. They may not be inside the stadium, may not have a ticket, but they want to experience the game day atmosphere. And you can do that whether you go to the game or not, whether it's tailgating on the quad or over by the uh, Rex fields, or it's in one of these great bars and restaurants. You can get a feel for the game day atmosphere without even going to the game. Well, still to come on Crimson Tide kickoff, see if Alabama men's basketball can keep a winning streak alive. We've got highlights from last night's game against Oakland coming up. And the Alabama women's team gears up for its biggest challenge of the non-conference season. We'll tell you what Coach Christy Curry has to say about this showdown coming up with the Duke Blue Devils. Crimson Tide kickoff will roll on right after this. You can 
see why we wanted him back. He's he scores the ball. He knows how to play in our system well. He's a tough kid. He's a good leader. He's a good kid. The fact that he's able to score a thousand points at, at one school, four games into his junior year, just kind of speaks to the career that he's carved out for himself here. Yeah, it does. Uh, Jaden Shackelford joining the 1,000 point club last night for Alabama against Oakland. He's just a early in his junior season. He might have a chance for 2,000 if he sticks around next year. Alabama beat a pretty good Oakland team, 86-59. There you see Javon Quinterly for three. Then off the miss, watch this. J.D. Davidson can really push the ball, and he's so fast he knows what to do with it. Big men run the floor. They deserve to get rewarded. Charles Bediaco did, and he got rewarded with the dunk. Here Shaq misses, which doesn't happen too often, but have no worries. Bediaco does not miss. He had 12 points and five rebounds. And then in the second half, Bama pulls away Shaq to Noah Gurley. Duck you very much. Alabama rolls 86-59. They're 4-0 oh on the season. And welcome back to CTKO. I'm Gary Harris inside our WVUA 23 studios in Bryant-Denny Stadium. Well, Alabama basketball entered the season with big expectations as they came into the year ranked in the preseason poll for the first time since 2011. And with any good college basketball team, there is a good student section. And earlier this week, CTKO's Matthew Travis caught up with Crimson Chaos brand new president, Blake Bullock. Matt. Thanks, Gary. Last year, Alabama lost a super fan in Luke Ratliff, who many knew as Fluffopotamus, or Fluff for short. And with that, Crimson Chaos lost their leader, who got the student section involved at basketball games. But someone had to step up with Alabama's basketball's expectations through the roof entering the 2021-22 season, and that man is Blake Bullock. Yeah, no, it's crazy. I mean, it's a blast, you know, getting everybody to be loud and have fun and stuff like that. But uh, it's more work than you would think, more work than I thought before. I just want us to, you know, stay loud, stay energetic, uh, pack the house, you know, just make it a tough place to play overall. Bullock takes over the role left behind by his best friend, Luke Ratliff, and he told me it's an honor to follow in the footsteps of Fluffopotamus. Oh, it's awesome. I mean, uh, Luke was one of my best friends, and so to be able to follow him like that, it, I mean, it's incredible. It means a lot. We would go to everything. I, I hadn't watched a basketball game without him here until this year. Uh, so, yeah, no, he was one of my best friends. We would go out all the time, and, yeah, I miss him a lot. Alabama is now three games into their season, and the student section has really made an impact on each of the Tide's games, so much so that Tide head coach Nate Oates recognized a group known as the Crimson Chaos following Alabama's win over Louisiana Tech. First thing I want to do is thank the student section for showing up huge. It was great. I think there's almost 3,000 students. They oversold it. It's awesome. It was a night to remember Fluff. You know, his family was here. His parents were here. We asked the student section to show up. They did come out of the uh, locker room and see the whole thing packed before uh, they, you know, 20 minutes before the game for Fluff's, uh, you know, presentation that they did for him, I thought was awesome. So thanks to the student section. It'd be great if we could get the student section to show up like that every night. In addition to each home game, Bullock also told me he plans on going to nearly every Alabama road game, thanks in part to the Crimson Tide Foundation, who started the Luke Fluffopotamus Ratliff Memorial Fund, which assists the Crimson Cast president in funding to every Alabama road game, as well as promotional items for each Alabama home game. Reporting for Crimson Tide Kickoff, I'm Matthew Travis. Thank you, Matthew. And you know, that really could be Fluffopotamus' legacy. What he built with that student section is going to continue for many years, Crimson Chaos. Well, this past Wednesday, Alabama women's basketball bounced back, to say the least. The Crimson Tide absolutely dominated Southern Miss in the second half to get that bitter taste of last weekend's loss to Tulane out of their mouths. Four players were in double figures in the 86-54 win, including the leading scorer for the game, Brittany Davis, who had a double-double with 23 points and double figures in rebounds as well. The Crimson Tide now turns its attention to Duke. They'll play the Blue Devils tomorrow in the Maggie Dixon Classic in Fort Worth, Texas. Tip-off against a really good Duke team is scheduled for 1 p.m. on Sunday.
You know, when you play a Duke team, um, you have to put four quarters together. We haven't done that yet, and everybody in that locker room knows that we can we can do that. And um, to be successful, um, you know, we're going to have to do that. I think it's it's going to be good because, honestly, um, you know, Nia and Jada both bring ACC experience. Um, I think they understand. Um, so I think we're just excited for a challenge, and we're excited to, you know, go on the road and honor to be a part of the Maggie Dixon Classic um, and what Maggie meant to our women's game. Um, we're very proud to go and represent and have this opportunity. Well, still to come on Crimson Tide Kickoff, I'll visit with Ryan Fowler, host of the game on Tide 100.9 FM about Alabama's outlook and if the Tide can reach the SEC championship game. And the Heisman buzz for Crimson Tide linebacker Will Anderson Jr. continues, but what does the Crimson Tide player himself think about all the attention that he's getting? Anderson will talk about the Heisman Trophy race when we return to CTKO. And welcome back to Crimson Tide Kickoff on WVUA 23. I'm Gary Harris, joined by my good friend Ryan Fowler, host of The Game, every weekday afternoon from 2 until 6 on Tide 100.9 FM. I also do The Gary Harris Show from 9 to 11. I'll plug that as well, Ryan, on Tide 100.9 FM. We're in the Tide 109 studios to talk some Bama football. Ryan, appreciate it, man. Absolutely. It's good to be able to talk with you. And, you know, we're gearing up for the final home game inside Bryant Diddy Stadium. Time flies. Hard to believe. Senior day for some of these guys. They went through senior day last year and they're back to go through it again. Let's talk about this game against Arkansas. And as we've seen this year in this conference, particularly in this division, the SEC West, you got to be ready to strap it on every week. But particularly with this Arkansas team, they're physical, they're well coached under Sam Pittman. They've proven they can play at the high level in this conference. They beat an AM team that beat Alabama. This is not a game just to get through it and get ready for the Iron Bowl. Alabama's going to have to, to come to play today. Well, you look at Arkansas, I think one of the most improved teams probably in our league when you look at where they were at last year. And I've tried to dig into it this week of why Sam Pittman has been able to connect. And I think it goes back to that locker room. Go back to when he left Georgia and watch the players respond to him getting the Arkansas job and the chemistry that he's able to build with those teammates. I think that's paying off for him this year. And think about Arkansas is coming to Tuscaloosa with a chance not to probably get a win against Alabama, but to end the season with, with eight wins. What a season this would be for Sam Pittman. And maybe the, you know, when you go back to the Lane Kiffin, Mike Leach hire, probably a little under the radar for Sam Pittman. Uh, but you have to be impressed early on with what he's been able to do. Yeah, and always a feather in the cap when you beat Alabama. Plus, Nick Saban is 14-0 and against Arkansas since he's been in Tuscaloosa. Season-wise, I mean – it's, it's Alabama. So you, everybody else is gauged here. Alabama's gauged here. I mean, they've got one loss. Uh, two more wins, and they're in Atlanta playing Georgia for the SEC championship in a spot in the college football playoff. They're number two in the college football playoff rankings, yet you listen to some people, and it's doom and gloom. There are a lot of people that aren't happy with where this Alabama football team is at. Well, and I think Nick Saban sometimes gauges the pulse, and I bet you if you ask him, he would probably rather it be on that side than the other side. Remember when it was 2019 in Alabama? Was it 2019, 2018? I get all the championships confused. But it was such a great year, yeah. and we were talking about the best team in the history of college yeah. football. And I think that did impact his team as they went to Santa Clara. Uh, Clemson didn't have a chance, and they beat Alabama 42 to, what was it, 14, 14, 17, something. Like that. But, it, but it was a game that Alabama – kind of thought they had won before they ever loaded the buses. So if you ask Nick Saban, I would bet that he's willing to say he would rather have it on this side than the other side. But I think it's the standard. It is the what they've created that it's hard to play up to that every single year, especially coming off of last year, arguably probably one of the greatest years in college football history. It's hard to match that. And I've said this multiple times on my show that I don't think Alabama has slid down any. I just think these other teams have been able to, to not – catch up with Alabama, but at least close the gap sure. somewhat. Yeah, and this SEC West is brutal. It's a good football team every week. If Alabama wins this afternoon, they clinch the SEC West, regardless of what would happen in the Iron Bowl, and you get your crack at Georgia. Now, we've watched Georgia. We're seeing what they're doing, and Kirby Smart – the Georgia Bulldogs under Kirby Smart are playing defense like it's 1999 or 2009 or 2011 or 2015. They're doing things defensively that we've talked about we didn't know if you could do in this day and age with the offenses the way they are. They're a powerful football team. Uh, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but if Alabama gets that opportunity, do you think the Crimson Tide can compete with the Bulldogs? I think offensively they would give Georgia some issues because, for one, I think the Georgia team, 
not conditioned, because at this point you're pretty well conditioned, but I think of being able to play for four quarters. This team has not had to do that. They've been able to play a lot of their guys. Now, that can be a benefit, but I think it also can be a weakness, too. I think Alabama has been in so many fights in fourth quarter battles that they're battle testing. I think that'll pay off for Alabama. Now, we'll see if it does against Georgia. I don't, I'm not going to take anything about Georgia because I look back at 2011. I said I never thought I'd see another defense that would give up that type of point total. You can calculate the competition, but in the current time of college football with all the rules favoring – you know, the offensive side, or most of the rules favoring the offensive side of the football, this defense has come to play. And you're almost a jealousy component when you look at that front and the way that they play physicality football. Alabama's always got a chance, who, who, whomever they're playing. Uh, but Georgia would be a tough hill to climb. I think they could beat them because if you're a Georgia fan, you're probably asking the question, can, can we score enough points yeah. to stay up with Alabama? And I think that's a major question as well. Finally, you know, for so long, with all the winning Alabama did, but elite quarterback play was never associated with the Crimson Tide. Now you look, and of course A.J.'s out for the year, but he's still in the league as a backup with the Falcons. I know people sometimes say Jalen is an elite quarterback, but he's starting for the Philadelphia Eagles. Tua starting for the Miami Dolphins. Mac Jones is starting as a rookie for the New England Patriots. And now Bryce Young appears that he's going to be a future NFL starter. So the last three quarterbacks that played here are starting the NFL, and you've got another one in Bryce Young. Elite quarterback play is now part of Alabama football. This has got to help Nick Saban in recruiting because no longer can be a, a game manager, just a guy to get it done. Uh, and, you know, if you look at the other side, if you want to compare it to Georgia, then you look at it and say, can an elite quarterback be here? Or that's is that the direction they want to go? Mm-hmm. Well, Nick Saban has proven that that's the direction that he wants to go is get elite play from the quarterback position. And I think it'll pay off with recruiting. And I think we're already seeing that, you know, with verbal commitments from major prospects uh, coming into Alabama. And I think it'll pay off for the future because you can go to Tuscaloosa, you can put up huge numbers, and you can have a lot of teammates around you to help you, you know, increase those numbers. Thank you, Ryan. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Ryan Fowler from The Game, CTKO. We'll return right after this. Yeah, I don't know if you saw the the kind of buzz and campaign for you to be in the Heisman conversation, but just what are your thoughts on that? Is that something you even pay attention to? I'm just focused on getting to a natty, <laughs> trying to get finish these last two games strong and get to the natty. That's all we worry about as a team, all I'm worried about. Alabama's Will Anderson Jr., big number 31, got 12 and a half sacks, 23 tackles for loss, leading college football in both categories, but he doesn't listen to the Heisman talk, to be honest, helping his team get in a position to win the national championship, he's heard him say, is probably the, the smart way to get Heisman consideration, too. Like Nick Saban says, you reach your team goals, and individuals will have an opportunity to reach their goals as well. And welcome back to Crimson Tide Kickoff. I'm Gary Harris. The finalists for the Heisman Trophy will be announced on Monday, December the 6th. Now, Anderson has already been named a finalist for the Bronco Nagurski Trophy, which goes to the top defensive player in college football. More honors for Alabama players. Offensive lineman Evan Neal is one of six semifinalists for the Outland Trophy, which is awarded to the nation's top interior lineman. In three seasons, Neal has started every game, first at left guard as a freshman before moving to right tackle last season and now left tackle this year. In his Alabama career, one and a half sacks and five and a half pressures on 350 pass attempts is all he's given up against tied opponents. That's impressive. Alabama wide receiver Jamison Williams is a semifinalist for the Belenikoff Award, which goes to college football's best wide receiver. No surprise here, Williams is the only receiver in the SEC with over 1,000 yards receiving through 10 games. Williams has 51 catches for 1,028 yards and 10 touchdowns. Those are eye-popping numbers. Well, with just a few weeks of action left, teams from all around the country are trying to end the 2021 campaigns on the best note possible, especially right here in the Southeastern Conference. CTKO's Dylan Morgan has everything you need to know in this week's Around the SEC. As the regular season in college football comes to a close, every game seems to be magnified with questions of bowl eligibility or even job security looming around many programs within the SEC. As the Florida Gators travel to Faro Field to take on the Missouri Tigers today at 3 p.m. on SEC Network, both teams will be entering the game at 5-5 five and five with the exact same goal in mind, to fight and become bowl eligible while hopefully getting their respective coaches off of the hot seat. 
Gator head coach Dan Mullen is 2-8 and eight in his last 10 games against Power 5 opponents and is looking to avoid the program's first 2-6 and six finish in SEC play since the league expanded its current format in 1992. For the Auburn Tigers, their matchup today against South Carolina will see some new faces on the field as not only T.J. Finley will be starting at quarterback for the remainder of the season following Bo Nix's season-ending ankle injury, but the Tigers will also be without their starting kicker, Anders Carlson, who is also out for the remainder of the year with a torn ACL. So Auburn will call upon the likes of sophomore Ben Patton and redshirt freshman Evan McGuire, who combined have a total of two kickoffs and extra points in their collegiate careers as they take on South Carolina at 6 p.m. on ESPN. And although Tennessee and South Alabama don't play each other often, when they kick off today at 6.30 on ESPNU, Vols fans might recognize the Jaguar starting quarterback from one of the most heartbreaking losses in recent years. South Alabama is led by Jake Bentley, who spent four years at South Carolina and led the Gamecocks to a stunning 24-21 victory in 2016 that knocked the Vols out of the SEC East race and what seemed to be the beginning of the end of the Butch Jones era. That'll wrap things up for Around the SEC. Reporting for CTKO, I'm Dylan Morgan. Thank you, Dylan. Jake Bentley's had quite a career, but he's finishing it up at South Alabama. Seems like he's been playing college football forever. Well, Mississippi State is in action as we speak against Tennessee State. Tennessee State's head coach is Tennessee Titans' great legendary running back Eddie George. How about that? Of course, MSU is trending upward. The college football playoff committee put the Bulldogs in the top 25 this week, the only four-loss team in the CFP rankings. Tonight, Auburn visits William Bryce Stadium in Columbia. Backup quarterback T.J. Finley will make his first start for the Tigers. It'll be his second career start against South Carolina. Remember last year, he got his first start for LSU against the Gamecocks and lit him up, throwing for 265 yards and two touchdowns and a rushing touchdown. As LSU rolled 52-24, you can bet Auburn's hoping for similar results tonight. LSU hosts Louisiana Monroe, led by Terry Bowden at 7 p.m. Tigers head coach Ed Orgeron says he will not play freshman quarterback Garrett Nussmeyer the rest of the season in order to protect the player's redshirt status. Last week against Arkansas, Nussmeyer, the son of former Alabama offensive coordinator Doug Nussmeyer, threw for 179 yards, a touchdown, and two picks in the loss to the Razorbacks. Another true freshman, Matt O'Dowd, will back up Mac Johnson the final two games of the season for LSU. Uh, it's special. Uh, I never thought, you know, growing up as a kid, being at Thompson High School, I was ever going to be in a position like this. Uh, but, God, nah, God is good. For real. That's Peter Woods, the big junior defensive lineman for Thompson High School. And the Warriors took care of Hoover in that big rematch last night in the Class 7A semifinals at the Hoover Met. That's Woods on the sack, and it bounces to Jeremiah Alexander, who is an Alabama commit. He's a senior. He goes in for the touchdown and Thompson rolled. After losing in the regular season to Hoover, they win it last night 35-10. to They'll take on Central Phoenix City in the Class 7-8 state championship game in early December at Protective Stadium in Birmingham. What a high school football game and a lot of college talent on that field last night on both sides. Still to come on Crimson Tide kickoff, CTKO's Mike Royer talks with Tuscaloosa probate judge Rob Robertson on Tuscaloosa's game day infrastructure. And Alabama baseball loads up on some top talent, making sure that the Crimson Tide gets the best players in West Alabama to stay close to home. We'll have that story coming up later on on CTKO. Welcome back into CTKO, everyone. My name is Mike Royer. We have a special guest today, Tuscaloosa County Probate Judge Rob Robertson as our guest. Judge Robertson, always good to see you. Good to see you, Mike. Glad I to be here. I told you before we began the segment, I wanted to have you explain to folks who, like me, had to be on a learning curve of understanding what the probate judge does. Where I'm from, the probate judge is way down the ballot list, and you may not know who's running against him because it's, it's important, but it's not that important. Tuscaloosa County is an entirely different thing. Your responsibilities are not only countywide, but you head the commission. You have a lot of responsibilities during election times. Uh, why is it different here, and why do we like the way it works here? Well, Tuscaloosa County is the largest county in Alabama that has a dual role, and that is, as you stated, probate judge who serves as the chair of the county commission. So you have 
the probate court and all the responsibilities, the elections and things that fall into that particular duty hat. And then you have the county commission, which is the the day to day, the government that runs our county. Um, I am the chief executive officer that's the daily uh, operations and working and all that gets done uh, mm -hmm. along with a wonderful staff at the county but that's kind of the way the role works in Tuscaloosa County. It's been that way for a long time. It has. You think it works just fine the way it is. I don't hear other people complaining about it. It seems to be something that does work well for Tuscaloosa County. Well as I stated we are the largest yeah. and, and the way it was structured in 1850 actually when the probate judges were established that was kind of the original structure to have mm -hmm. that dual hat but as counties have grown some have bifurcated and changed some of those duties but uh, we're we're still doing it that way so it uh, leads to busy days i can look around uh, the state of alabama counties in alabama and find some elected officials that don't have too too much to do it sounds like your plate's a little full but with a fine staff manageable makes all the difference in the world if you didn't have them no uh, you know just Staying on top of it, and you know, we we have a, a lean government philosophy in yeah. Tuscaloosa County. Mm -hmm. We try to get mm -hmm. the most out of those taxpayer dollars and do all we can with those. And uh, our government is kind of structured that way as a result. Um, so we all stay pretty busy at uh, county know. government here. Our conversation is uh, being heard during a sports program here. Yeah. It's a Saturday, another football Saturday in Tuscaloosa. Not only are we the largest county, but on game day, we're one of the largest populations in the state, too. Exactly. How right. the university handles that, how uh, the athletic department handles mm -hmm. that is important not only to the city of Tuscaloosa, but to the county, too. Tell me about that impact on our county, well, positive you're, impact. You're exactly right. I mean, our population essentially doubles in the city of Tuscaloosa. Our current census numbers from 2020 countywide are 227,000, but any mm -hmm. game day weekend, we add... Uh, of course, we have locals that attend as well, but mm -hmm. coming to campus and around a game, we may have 110, 120,000 people moving about and involved. So it is a substantial challenge. Um, we're glad to have the visitors and yeah. come in, but of course, we have a lot of responsibilities and public safety that we work through for weekends like that. West Alabama has changed so much since Mercedes came more than 20 years ago and since then so many more businesses, so many more opportunities here. All good news, but with that growth comes challenges. What are those challenges? You can't look at tomorrow. You've got to look five years and 10 years, 20 years down the road. What are the challenges you're most concerned about going forward? Well, we are blessed with, with growth. Um, you know, I would take that uh, compared to the alternative any day sure. of the week. 16.6% uh, sure. growth over the last uh, census period and, and still growing. Uh, we have a lot of great economic opportunity. Um, you know, I think around the country, and Tuscaloosa is not unique in that one of our big challenges is just making sure we have enough labor. Um, we have enough qualified, trained labor to fill all the opportunities that we have before us. Uh, that's, that's a challenge. With growth, we have more demands for housing. Um, and the interesting trends, we're seeing a lot more growth move into the unincorporated portions of our county, mm -hmm. um, which is a little different than years ago. And I would attribute some of that to some of the changes and the experience that we've had through COVID. People want a little more elbow room and uh, just looking at life a little differently. We covered a story this week about how mm -hmm. businesses are coming out of the pandemic, trying to get folks to come back to work. A lot of folks yes. have gotten used to working from home. Your government employees were away some during the pandemic, but everyone's back in place doing their job. And I guess most of your folks are vaccinated too and taking care of each other. Well, and, and I, again, I will attribute this 100% to our dedicated staff, but we were probably a bit unique in that we, we did not stop any day or any service the county provided in Tuscaloosa wow. all through COVID. That's amazing. Be because we are kind of the transactional arm of the state, if we stop, I mean, there's nothing that we do that's not essential. You can't yeah. buy and sell houses if you can't record deeds. Yep. If you can't, I mean, all these functions have to happen to just keep going. When people needed to take a little refuge through COVID, it was our duty as county employees to be there yep. and make sure we kept at it and we just had to figure out how to do it safely. We hope most of that is in our rear view mirror. We appreciate mm -hmm. your leadership. It's always good to see you out and about when we're covering news stories. Your demeanor in your leadership, I notice and hear from others, calmness and uh, if you're gonna scream and yell, you close your door to do it. But I, I hear nothing but good things about your leadership and I appreciate oh, your you. time today. Thank you. Thank and, you. and it's just, 
it's a great community. It's just an honor to serve. All right, so. Judge Rod, Rob Robertson, probate judge of Tuscaloosa County. Are you allowed to say Roll Tide being from Florida? I can say Roll Tide. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> At the top I'm, of your a, I'm an alum, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. all so the way through. Double alum, Roll Tide. Go. All yes, right, sir. Rob, thanks very yeah. much. Thank uh, you. Pleasure talking to you, Judge Robertson. Thank you. CTKO will continue in just a moment. The coaches and people at Alabama really tre treated me well. And, uh, you know, I spoke with some other people, but ultimately it worked out with them, and I'm excited to stay in Tuscaloosa. So. On Monday, two Shelton State Bucks signed to play baseball for the Crimson Tide. Corner infielder Walt Bailey from Hillcrest High School in Tuscaloosa and shortstop Drake Logan from Colorado Springs. Played for that great program of Bobby Sprouse. They're going to play for the Crimson Tide. Kylan Long, a pitcher from Millbrook, signed to play with the Auburn Tigers. Welcome back into Crimson Tide kickoff. Let's get a final check on our forecast as Gracie is back with us. Hey, Gracie. Yes, let's look at that radar right now. We are clear, and we'll see that here. If we look at the rest of your game day forecast, and we're seeing 65 for kickoff. That's all we're going to, as warm as we're going to get today, and then low 50s. So enjoy your night. Bundle up and stay warm out there. Thank you, Gracie. It's football weather. It's a football Saturday. That's been Crimson Tide kickoff. This has been Crimson Tide kickoff. We're glad that you've been with us. Catch the news at 10. Matthew Travis will be in with a recap of Alabama and Arkansas. It's beautiful. Crowds are starting to gather for the Walk of Champions. Game time's about two and a half hours away.